Hello, Hope. We are so grateful to be with you today, and just it's an encouragement to be standing before you. Uh, as you've noticed, we are without Nate today. He is getting some rest and relaxation, and so keep him in your prayers. Um, but being gathered here today is just a reminder for me that what the world scatters, the Lord is always gathering and bringing back together. And so this congregation, this worship, this sermon is an opportunity to be united in spirit and one in community. And so we're just grateful for these messages, for this community, for this spirit that continues to tie us together, even during disjointed times like the ones we're in right now. So we're going to continue this worship together and begin it with song. So please join us, and the lyrics will be on the screen below. Thank you. A thousand times I failed, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame yeah in my heart and my soul I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord, let justice and praise become my embrace, to love you from the inside out. purpose remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame yeah in my heart and my soul I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord, let justice and praise become my embrace, to love you from the inside out, everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades, never your glory goes beyond all fame And the cry of my heart Is to bring you praise from the inside out Lord, my soul cries out everlasting Your light will shine when all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond is to bring you praise from the inside out Lord my soul cries out Lord 
Always grateful to worship with Sam Marsh. Sam is a wonderful woman and a wonderful asset for this church and also a wonderful asset for God's kingdom. And she's just a, a great example of someone who's using their gifts and talents that God has bestowed upon them to give God glory. So we're always grateful for Sam Marsh. Thank you, Sam. Uh, as you notice now, uh, Nate Stratman, our pastor, is not with us today. He is out in the Outer Banks with his family, enjoying a time of rest uh, away from church for a while. And uh, we just pray for that family. We pray that they, uh, they rest easy and uh, see God through this time uh, away. And uh, we pray for safe travels for that family back to us. Yes, and as soon as Nate gets back, uh, the work resumes. We are going to be having a book study together as a congregation on the book, The Color of Compromise. The Zoom link and the gathering inform information is in the newsletter. You can see it all there. It's going to start next or this coming Tuesday night, um, and all the details are in the newsletter. If you have any questions about that, just feel free to email or text or call any of us at the church, and we'll get you plugged in. All the information you need to, to join in that four-week study with the church. It's going to be great. And now, church, we're going to go into a time of confession. This is where we corporately say this universal prayer of confession and give up to God that uh, the stuff that we know is not of God, that's in our hearts, in our minds. And when we do that, we start the process of relinquishing all that heavy burden and all of those sins off of our heart and let God wear them. So we're going to own that sin together as one and say that prayer of confession in order to let God own it for us. Will you join us? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. And to the glory of your name, amen. And now, let's have a time in silence where we give up to God what we need to. We are so grateful to worship a God that is merciful and one who we can take all of these burdens uh, to um, with a repenting heart and um, that because he is so good and as we'll hear in Will's, Will's message, he is so just that he will forgive us and pardon us of these sins. So it's not something we have to carry around. It's not a yoke on our necks, um, but we can give them to God and walk free because um, that's what Jesus came to do to set us free. And so we are free indeed in Christ, and now we walk into our week wearing that freedom. And um, with our freedom, we also take a moment to offer our gifts. We give our gifts um, of our talents, but also our treasures. And so all the gifts that we've been giving, that every one of you have been giving to this church, have been being used wisely and doing the kind of work that is good in this community and for the kingdom. And we are grateful for these gifts, and you ha will have information on your screen on where to give, how to give. And again, we are just so grateful for these author offerings and tithes, and um, we are grateful for your gifts to this church. Now, we have a God who is many things, as we've been talking about in this series, More to God, right? He's the He's the ideal of so much, the ideal of everything, the ideal of goodness, the ideal of love and mercy and forgiveness, but he's also the ideal of justice. And today, we're grateful to have our very own Will Cameron. Will is one of the elders of this church, and he's going to give us a message today on just that, the justice of God and how God is just. Take it away, Will. Hello, Hope Community Church. Uh, it is great to be with you today in worship. Uh, our fearless leader, Nate Stratman, is at the Outer Banks getting some well-deserved R&R uh, with his family. Nate, uh, if you're watching this, which I hope you're not, I hope you're out doing something fun like surfing or fishing, uh, but if you are, just want to tell you, you know, thank you so much for all the hard work that you've put into leading this church. Uh, we appreciate you and, and hope that you're uh, getting restored and uh, getting some great time with your family. You know, the one thing I love about this church is that it's not a church of one person. It's not a church of the head pastor. 
It's actually a church of, of every one of us uh, that is growing in Christ together, and I'm just grateful to be able to grow uh, in Christ with you today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much uh, for this opportunity for this church to be in worship together, uh, to be looking to you. Uh, Father, I pray at this point, uh, Will Cameron will cease to speak, that you will do all the talking from here on out, and Father, that we will take your words and we will wrestle with it, and that we will uh, not just dismiss it, but we will think about it and talk about it and apply it. And Father God, we are just uh, grateful for all that you give to us. We love you in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we will be continuing our series on more to God. Uh, over the last several weeks, we've been talking about the characteristics of God. Uh, and if you can think about the character of God in a, in a 3D image, we've, each week we've kind of been rotating that image a little bit and describing God from a slightly different angle. So uh, we started with talking about the, the sovereignty of God. We talked about how God is a banner. We talked about the timing of God. And then last week, uh, Don masterfully talked about how uh, God is merciful and, and the mercy of God. And so we're going to continue with that theme today and talk about how God is just. I can't think of another time in my life uh, where justice has been demanded by so many people and talked about by so many people than it is right now. People are demanding uh, racial equality. They're, they're demanding uh, um, the right to either wear masks or to not wear masks, to be in school or to not be in school. Uh, they're demanding uh, justice for uh, things like um, the Jeffrey Epstein case and just all that surrounds that on sex trafficking. And th there's just all these issues where everybody, no matter what side you're on, is demanding justice uh, for these things. So what does God say about justice? Um, you know, even my three-year-old daughter, Millie, is demanding justice right now. The other day, we were reading a uh, story about the Good Samaritan, and these robbers come up and beat up this man and leave him on the side of the road for dead, and as I'm, uh, we're looking at the pictures in the book, and, and she gets this face, uh, this look on her face, and she's like, I want to bite the bad man's. And yeah, she hasn't quite figured out how to make certain words plural yet, but it, that's besides the point. The point is that everybody, even my daughter, is demanding justice. And so what does it look like? What, is, what does God say about, about justice? We all want justice for, our, for others. You know, we want people to be held to justice. But when the, when the lens is turned and it's faced towards us, what do we want? We want grace, don't we? We want justice for others, but we want grace uh, for ourselves. And I know as soon as I started talking about the fact that we'd be talking about justice this week, some of you were already picking up the remote to change it uh, back, probably to watch uh, Dawn's message from last week again, that, so that we, you could again see mercy, grace, these topics that we love. And those are great topics, but it doesn't paint the full picture. We have to understand God's justice. And so what I want us to wrestle with over the next 15 minutes is this question. Does God's grace and mercy mean anything without his justice? If you'll go ahead and open your Bibles to Isaiah 30. Um, when I was looking up scripture and, and, and kind of trying to see what does the Bible say about God's justice, I uh, I had a little bit of a problem. I wanted to kind of isolate this issue of justice, but everywhere I looked in this book, when I saw justice, I also saw God's grace and mercy somehow linked to it. And I kept saying, no, I really want to focus on justice. And the words and the Holy Spirit kept saying, no, 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 you can't just talk about justice because they won't fully get it unless we show how uh, it actually fits into the bigger picture of God's grace and mercy. So what's happening in Isaiah 30 right now, uh, it's in the year 700 BC, and the Assyrian army is becoming a massive force. They've actually taken over 
uh, from modern-day Iraq to the borders of Egypt, and they have invaded Israel, okay? And they're actually getting up to Jerusalem, and they're getting ready to attack Jerusalem. And the king of Judah decides that instead of going to God for help, I'm going to reach out to Egypt to try to help save us from the Assyrians. And as you can imagine, this does not go over well uh, with God. Um, And so we pick up here in verse 9. For these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression, and depended on deceit, the sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly that that among its pieces not a fragment will be found. For taking coals from a hearth or scooping uh, water out of a cistern. Then verse, uh, verses 15 through 17 continue to talk about how uh, Israel's enemies, the Assyrians, are actually going to cause Israel to flee until there's nothing left of Israel except a flag on a hill. And then we pick back up with verse 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. There's, the scripture paints a helpful picture of God's justice in relationship with his grace. And there's three primary points that I want to talk about today. First is God is just. So we're going to explore what that means. The second point is God's justice gives meaning and worth to his grace. And then third, God's justice is the method by which he extends his grace. So we'll jump right into it. God is just. What does it mean for God to be just? Isaiah 30 gives us a good example of how God is acting justly. The sin of the Israelites to go to Egypt without ever, you know, uh, talking to God about coming to God for help. I mean, can you imagine being God in this situation? You have created a nation. You have a covenant with a nation to be your light in the world. You have brought them out of Egypt, out of slavery. You have provided for them in the desert. You have given them a promised land. You have defeated their enemies over and over and over and over again. But yet now the Assyrians are too big of a force that the Israelites need to reach out to Egypt of all nations. Can you imagine being God in that situation? And God says, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. And I'm going to repeat verse 12. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression, and depended on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly in an instant. Talking about the sin of the Israelites, this high wall. But if we're not careful, we can read this chapter and simply see it for God acting in a just manner. But it's much more than that. We need to We need to clarify that it's not just that God acts justly. It's that God is just. It is who he is. Deuteronomy 32.4 puts it this way. He is the rock. His works are perfect. And all his ways ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. It is his DNA. It is who he is. He cannot act unjustly. It says all his ways are just. And I think this distinction is important because some of you, the the term justice, as soon as I said that for the first time, you get this negative connotation. It's almost like maybe you've been burned by a form of justice system. Maybe you were wrongfully accused uh, by a judge or maybe somebody you love was. Or, Or maybe somebody in a position of authority, maybe even a father figure, treated you in an unjust way when their role, when their authority was to carry out right and wrong within your family, but they didn't do that. And so your concept 
of justice is that well, even when people are in positions of authority, they can still act unjust, and that's not God. That's, that's, that's impossible. God is just. God, a good example is, you know, for God to act unjustly would be like the sun to decide to rise tomorrow and be cold. It's just not going to happen. The sun is 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. It's 90-something out this week, and I've been melting. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, the sun is hot and God is just. And so we can take faith and comfort in knowing that he, he upholds right and he punishes wrong. So my question for you is, do you really want a just God? Or do we want to make him into a God that we're more comfortable with? I mean, if, he, if God has to deal with, with, with punishing sin and punishing wrong, then do we really want to talk about that? Or do we want to just paint this nice, more comfortable version of who God is? Because we, we love talking about grace and mercy, and I'm, I do too. I'm right there with you. I mean, just take my mom, for example. She goes to Grace Church in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, in her home, there's a big uh, painting that says, blessed by the grace of God, okay? Her, her dog's name is Gracie, and just like any good Southern woman, she uses the term gracious sakes all the time, okay? Grace is everywhere, right? Like, we love that term, but you don't see that about justice, Justice brings something else that maybe we really don't want to deal with because uh, we understand the significance of it. But would grace mean anything if we did not have a God that was perfectly just and righteous? I'll give you an example. I had this babysitter when I was young, and she, we would get away with anything. She really didn't care what we did as long as it looked like she did her job uh, while she, before my parents got home. And I mean, I, I could, you know, prank call the neighbors, I could flush socks down the toilet, I could light something on fire outside, you know, and, and as long as like by the time my parents got back home, it looked like, you know, she had done her job, then she would forgive us, right? She would say, okay, it's okay, you know, but, but that's not forgiveness, that's not grace. She just didn't care enough to want to, to deal with it. There's a difference, she just, she didn't care about me enough to be able to want to uphold right and wrong, to be able to want to get involved in my life to, for it to mean anything. But I tell you what, if my dad got home and found that out, oh, I remember being upstairs and he'd get home and find out something I did and I can, I can still hear him coming up the stairs. You could hear his belt rattling and he'd pull that thing off and he would fold it over in half and he would snap it. And, it, you know, it was kind of for dramatic effect, but he would snap that thing, crack, crack, as he came up the stairs. I could hear his footsteps and that belt cracking, and, and that's when the kids would scatter, right? That's when you just hid. And, and don't get me wrong, my father was, handled it very well, um, you know, it, it, and, but my point is, when he came up those stairs, I knew that he was going to deal with uh, the payment of my sins, you know, punishing my wrongdoings. And so for him to say... You know, Will, um, I'm not going to punish you this time. That would have meant everything. I mean, I would have been on cloud nine. It would be like I won the lottery, right? It would have meant so much because my dad does love me, and he does deal with right and wrong. And so for him to give me grace and mercy would have meant everything. The problem is we treat God like the babysitter who doesn't care. We say, oh, he will forgive me. You know, it's not that big of a deal. He loves me and he will give me mercy and grace, which is true, but we abuse it and it dilutes the significance of his gift. We are like the Israelites in verses 10 through 11, and I'll read it again. The Israelites were saying, say to the seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. That's kind of what we turn into when we only want to focus on the message of grace and dilute who God is as being a just God. We want to hear what makes us comfortable. Does that sound like some of the gospel message that we hear in our country today? My wife and I uh, watched the American Gospel on Netflix, which I highly recommend you do. Uh, it is well worth your time. 
And it talks about this, how the, the message of the gospel has been diluted in America, which is devastating to Christianity and to our understanding of, of the true gospel. It's only when we fully understand that we have built up this wall that Isaiah is talking about, this wall that is bulging and cracking with our sin. It's only when we realize that and then we realize who God is that he has to uphold right and wrong and uphold right, punish wrong. It's only when we put those two things together that we can grasp the significance of his grace. Verse 18 picks up with a beautiful three-lettered word. We have this wall of sin we, and, and we deserve God's justice. And then verse 18 picks up with this. Yet. What a great word. As I have studied this and, and dealt with this over the past month, that word yet could almost summarize a lot of what's in this book. It's the fact that we deserve death. We des- we, our sin is, is worthy of death. Yet. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. And I wonder, you know, all of us have these walls of sin. What, what is your wall? You know, some of us, our wall is pride and selfishness. And we build brick by brick by brick this wall that is bulging and cracking. And we deserve it to come crashing down on us. But yet, for some of us, it's, it's sexual immorality. Uh, for some of it's, it, it's divorce. For some of it's, I mean, the list goes on and on. Addictions, these walls that we build up brick by brick, and we deserve them to come crashing down, but yet the Lord longs to be gracious to us. So if God is just, and he can't act in a way that is unjust, meaning he must uphold righteousness, how can he extend grace and mercy to those who don't deserve it? You know, I mean, if, if he has to be just and he has to deal with, with wrong, how can he extend grace and mercy to those who don't deserve it? Which brings me to my third point, which is God's justice is actually the method by which he is able to extend his grace. So meaning his grace is actually made possible through his justice. If God is just, and part of being just means that he must demand payment for our sin, then how can that punishment actually be the vehicle or method whereby he extends his grace? Let me put it to you like this. There's a story of two best friends from from birth, from, from childhood. And just to put it in context of people that you know, it'd be like me and Stephen Sayer, okay? We have known each other since I can remember, and, and been friends ever since. And, and there's something about having that history that is, you just can't replicate that. And so these two friends, they go down very different paths. One friend goes on to law school, they become a judge. The other one goes down a much different path, makes some bad decisions, and one day commits a crime where he finds himself in the courtroom of his best friend from childhood. And everybody that was kind of watching this unfold and they said, oh, well, you know, for sure, because of their relationship, uh, he's going to get off easy, right? The judge is going to give his friend, let his friend off easy. But instead, the, je- the judge upholds the maximum fine. He gives the maximum fine to his best friend. And everybody can't believe it. But then, as soon as he does that, he gets up and he goes to the clerk of court and he pays that fine for his friend. That is how God can both uphold justice while extending mercy. He is being just because he's making sure that the payment is made, but then he is the one that's actually paying it. So what what is that payment? That payment is Jesus Christ. God knew that he had to deal. He couldn't turn a blind eye to our sin. He had to deal with it, and therefore he sent his son Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to bear the weight of our sin. And the, the, the night before Jesus was arrested, it says that he was sweating blood. 
He was sweating blood. He even asked, like, let this cup be taken from me. Is there another? He asked God, is there another way? But ultimately, Lord, you, Father, your will be done. And what, I, I, in try better understanding that, it wasn't that he was just scared of, of being crucified and the actual physical pain of that. That's not it at all. He knew that he had to bear the weight, bear the walls of every one of us, of me, of you, of all of us. He had to bear the weight of, that, of those walls that came crashing down on him in one instant when he felt the wrath and the judgment of his father as he was on the cross. That is what caused him to sweat blood. That is what caused him to, to ask, is there any other way? And that is the payment that satisfies. That's called the propitiation for our sin, the payment that satisfied, and that is in Jesus Christ. Ro uh, Paul words it like this in Romans 3.26. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. God is enforcing the punishment and paying the price. This is why God's justice is so connected uh, to his grace. And I couldn't find a way to describe it except by combining the two. I started this message by talking about how everybody is demanding justice. But do people that are demanding justice apply the same grace and compassion that God extends to us as he upholds justice? Think about what we say to people. Think about what we post on social media. Think about how we respond when someone cuts us off in traffic or or when a neighbor is different from us and doesn't mow their grass for a while. You know, think about our responses and the things that we're demanding justice for. Even the very significant things, because I don't want to downplay those. But do we demand justice for people as a means of extending them grace? And Hope Community, my prayer for this church is that we will seek justice not to put someone in their place but as a means of extending the grace of Jesus Christ to others. Amen. Every imposter, every contender will fail. no kingdom, authority, power like yours. No one more royal, no one more loyal than one God, one truth. No other kingdom, no other freedom like yours. Oh, Silenced and scattered by you. The people are rising, we realize it is finished, it's finished. We stand in the promise, it is accomplishing you. strong and mighty enough you are king and I hide covered by your wings and it's there you 
No princes or powers will have my worship. No threat of darkness and no fear of failing will steal my purpose. You're my surrender, protector, defender, and Church, thank you so much for worshiping with us tonight. Uh, as we kind of go forward, remember that this is not the end of the worship service. This is now just the opportunity for us to walk into our day to day and continue that worship and respond uh, to this message of justice and grace. And, and I just hope that we understand that our God is just and he upholds right, and yes, he punishes wrong, but he does it in a way to be able to extend us grace. And so as we go out into our, our lives and our day-to-day, -day, let us uphold justice for a purpose of extending grace to others. And now let us go uh, with, the, with praise on our lips by singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 